morning, everybody. It's good to be in God's house today. It is warm in here, and it's cold outside, and uh, it's just wonderful to, to be here uh, in, in witness of God's Spirit among us. Um, uh, this morning, I want, want to welcome everybody in attendance here and everybody worshiping with us online. Um, and I have a couple announcements this morning. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody that showed up to the meet and greet with our uh, our candidate, uh, Pastor Doug Pfeiffer. Um, we met Wednesday night to, to get a chance to talk with him a little bit, hear a little bit about his ministry. And uh, I think we had 50-some people show up. And uh, it was it was wonderful to see you all. You all represented Park Avenue really well, and uh, we appreciate that. And I know that uh, Pastor Doug appreciated that as well. Um, today, immediately after worship, um, our congregation will meet right here in the sanctuary. Um, so don't move after worship. Stay here. Um, you have your chance to be part of the process of decision making. And um, we will take kind of our final step in the process of our search committee, our personnel committee, our general board, all of have approved to move forward with um, um, considering Pastor Doug is the senior minister here. So this afternoon, uh, the whole congregation has a chance to hear a little bit about him, consider the financial package, and make a vote um, as to whether or not to make a call to, to Pastor Doug. So please stay here after uh, worship, and uh, we'll try to keep the meeting brief, but uh, provide some information and answer some questions if anybody were to have any. So... It's exciting times at Park Avenue Church. Uh, we're in a transition, and uh, I think we're going to keep moving through this, and we'll be in great shape. We've come through so many transitions so well in the last three years, so uh, thank you for staying part and being in the community of Park Avenue Church. Now let's prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs>
to call us to worship this morning. Uh, I would like to read a few words from Psalm 119. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain, gain understanding from them and your precepts. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for the glorious gift of your spirit in all of us. As we listen to and feed our lives on your word today, we pray it grows us in wisdom and knowledge and strength of spirit. And Lord, in your spirit that is ever growing in us, let us be a blessing and love to one another and out in the world through our worship here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Have a seat. Um, prayer concerns today. We have a few new ones, but before I get into them, I wanted to give a thank you to uh, Dean Portinga and Kirk Johnson. They, uh, in preparing the offices for uh, for a uh, new pastor, they painted the uh, the registers, the the covers for heat, and it looks like they did a nice job both in the pastor's office and the office manager's office office manager's office, so thank you both very much. Um, in our prayers today, we need, uh, I hate to have to, I have to bring this up so much, victims of the mass shootings, um, the troubled shooters, and then I think of their families and it just breaks my heart. The victims of the um, tornadoes and earthquakes, the people still digging out from that massive snowfall, the family of Glenn McLean, uh, Dave Mattern, is a friend of theirs. He asks us to keep Glenn McLean's family upon, uh, in our prayers upon his death. We're still lifting up the Flag family upon Lori's death. Uh, Lois Birmingham's uh, uh, knee replacement has been delayed a bit, so keep her in your prayers. And we're still thinking of, De of Jason Schrod and his family upon his death. The full list will be sent out to you tomorrow, and I urge you to uh, practice an active prayer life. It does us good. It uh, enlightens our soul. It strengthens our relationship with God. Will you bow your heads with me? Our loving God, we present to you our troubled world. Well, it's your troubled world. And we apologize that uh, we seem to have... Uh, made a mess of it in some areas. Please forgive us for that. And please help us find a way to do our little part in taking care of this wondrous place. Be with those folks we've mentioned in our prayers. If their lives have been struck by tragedy or death or illness, be with them. Touch them with your spirit. Heal them. Let them know that your love is strong. Please touch each of us with your presence this week. Remind us that we are your people. We represent you. 
So help us represent you in the very best way we can. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, for your mercy, and for your guidance. All this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will the kids come up for the children's sermon, please? What would you say this is? Don't know? What? A it's a giraffe. Very good. Whew. I was going to have to eat it if you didn't guess. Okay, then. What would you say this is? A gorilla. You agree? A gorilla? Very good. Everything I pick out is either a gorilla or a giraffe. I'm looking for this. Hippo. Oh, you think it's a hippo? Huh. I thought it was a tiger, but I don't know. <laughs> One more. I thought it was a monkey. What are all these things? They represent animals. They're part of God's creation. Do you all know what God said when he got done making the world? You know what God said? And then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. God thought everything he made was very, come on up, we don't need sliding. God thought everything he made was very, very good. Now, back in the first chapter, he said, let us make man in our own image. Man, that's all of us. In our likeness, let them, come on, give us a break. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth. What's it mean to have dominion over something? It means you take care of it. Give me a breath. You take care of it. So, when I'm done eating these animal crackers, can I throw this package on the ground? No. Why? It's littering. It's littering. And that's hard on the earth. We're supposed to take care of it. When I'm brushing my teeth or washing my hands, can I waste water? No. Why? Because it's... You're wasting the water, and we're supposed to take care of God's creation. That's our job, to take care of God's creation. So anytime you catch yourself thinking about littering, don't do it. And anytime you think you find yourself in a situation where you can save water, save water. What else did God make? We're supposed to take care of them, too. We're supposed to take care of God's earth. And this is Earth Sunday is why we're talking about this. This is the Sunday we're supposed to think about taking better care of God's earth. I know. Today is the 16th, and it's Earth Sunday. Earth Day comes later. But this is the Sunday we're supposed to take, think about taking care of God's earth. Any questions? Then I have some animal crackers for you. Just a minute. Is your brother here? Take one to him anyway.
I dreamed I went to heaven, and you were there with me. We walked upon the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. someone called your name we turned and saw a young man and he was smiling as he came and he said friend you may not know me now and then he said but wait to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart. He 
said, my child, look around you. For great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. I want to tell you about, about, about the uh, best softball game I ever saw. Uh, our granddaughter was playing, and I don't know how old she was, but she was little. It was t-ball, and I don't know how old these girls were, but they were little. But the game was fascinating. Uh, you, you hear the coach yelling for his girls to pay attention, look up, watch the ball, get your head in the game. And you'd look out, and you'd see the third grader squatted down, filling her glove with sand. And you could look over and you'd see that the shortstop wasn't even there. The shortstop had wandered over and she was talking to the second baseman. And these little girls, they'd get up and they'd hit the ball. And if it went more than four or five feet, they were lucky. So you can imagine what the outfielders were doing. They were not engaged. Their minds were elsewhere. They were thinking about other things. When it comes to Easter, that's where you and I may be. We went all the way through Lent. We had a big build-up, and, and then came Easter, and we celebrated it last year in a wonderful worship service with all the flowers, and, and we celebrated the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And that's where I need our minds to be as we continue this week. So please indulge with me as I share with you events following the crucifixion and then the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. As you know, we mentioned last week, Easter, that Mary Magdalene was one of the women who went to the tomb and found uh, the tomb of Jesus and found that Jesus had risen from death and that the tomb was easy, the tomb was empty. And later that day, as the disciples of Jesus were gathered together behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities who had orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus, and then the resurrected Jesus just appeared to them in their midst and greeted them by saying, peace be with you. And that's when he showed them the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side. Then you'll recall that Thomas was not with them when Jesus first appeared to the other disciples, remember? Thomas said, unless I see the scars of the uh, nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And for that attitude and that comment, we have labeled him with a label that has stuck with him throughout history. You know what it is? You know what it is. Then a week later, Jesus appeared to the disciples again. As the disciples gathered behind locked doors, only this time the Apostle Thomas was there with the group and Thomas met Jesus and believed. The Bible tells us that Jesus appeared with, for days and days, for weeks and weeks he was with them. At the end of the Gospel of John, there's a verse that says, now there are many other things that Jesus did. If they were all written down one by one, I suppose that the whole world could not hold the books that would be written. I expect that when something amazing happens to us, we are changed. We're changed in ways that may be obvious and and may be hidden deep within us. Our our very character, our, our values, our worldview, the beliefs that direct our lives might even be changed when something really big, really amazing happens to us. I've often thought that maybe winning the lottery might change things for us. 
Now, I can't speak, to, uh, I can't speak for you women, but I've noticed that guys make a change when they are courting women they hope to marry. They improve their personal hygiene. They pick up their apartments. They might wash their truck before dates. They might even start eating salads. I know that happened to me. And children, having a baby enter your life and join your family, that causes things to change. Suddenly you have a new responsibility and it alters the way you look at life. If any of you served in the military as first enlisted and then as an officer, I can tell you that when you're an enlisted, you get indoctrinated about who to salute and when to salute and how to salute. But then if you turn into an officer, receiving those salutes really throws you for a, throws your, it throws your life out of whack because you're accustomed to giving the salute and now you have to receive the salutes. So they have to salute first and then it's very confusing. Significant events change us. Marriage, graduation, promotion, a new job, buying your first home, moving to a new city, even health issues that alter the way we live our lives. Significant events change us. So here's my question for the day. How does being died for change us? The fact that Jesus died to save us. How does being died for change us? How are we altered when we realize that Jesus died to open our pathway to be forgiven, to be saved from our sins, to be elevated to being a person of wondrous hope? How does that change us? The Gospel of John, chapter 21, our scripture for today. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord, Peter answered, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter became sad because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And so he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. A person living with resurrection carries an extra load. A person living with resurrection and the hope of eternal life as, as just part of themselves and part of who they are, they, we, carry an extra load. It's not a terrible load to carry. Jesus even said of it, come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for the yoke I will give you is easy and the load I will put on you is light. This week I had a conversation with a person who is fearful about the future and angry with our economy and frustrated with our government. And he was carrying a load of irritation and hopelessness that was very, very obvious. How are you and I, how should you and I practicing Christians People who believe in the promise of the Gospels, folks who claim that we are attempting to live a life as Jesus would have us live. How should you and me be affected by the resurrection of Jesus and by the promise of eternal life that the message of Jesus offers? How should that affect us? How do you think our living ought to be altered because of the teaching, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the call of Jesus? So last week we celebrated Easter and the resurrection. And we have stood up and said that we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That we accept his teaching is valid for us. How should that affect the way we live our lives? You heard what Jesus, what the resurrected Jesus, you heard what Jesus advised to Simon Peter, take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep. What does that mean? 
this isn't an easy demand for us. In Luke 10, 3, Jesus sent out 72 of his disciples to share the good news. He said, you, he said I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. And that's kind of sobering. But that's our task. Here's a passage that sort of defines people in our own time. As Jesus saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do you think that sounds like the people of our day? Worried and helpless like people without a shepherd. Jesus often references sheep and lambs as metaphors for people and the challenges of life. So, when Jesus urges Simon Peter to take care of my sheep, something of substance is being presented. Not only for Simon Peter, but for you and me, people who are living with the resurrection, people who have part of our value structure as the resurrection. There's some obvious responses that Jesus suggested to his followers. These things we know, even if we don't work diligently at addressing these issues. Jesus presented these tasks for believers in his parable about the final judgment in Matthew 25. It's in the last chapter before the Last Supper. The righteous souls come before Jesus for judgment. The unrighteous as well. And Jesus says to the righteous that because of the way they, well, it says this, I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me in prison and you visited me. And the righteous souls then responded, Lord, we never saw, we never saw you, so how could we have done this for you? And Jesus replied, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. These are examples of how someone lives their life when they are people of the resurrection. So what else? This is when our individual personalities come into play. Each of us are different. We know from the writings of the Apostle Paul, each of us has received different gifts and spirits. So if you are seriously wondering how you should live as a person of the resurrection, how you should live as a, as a person of Jesus, how, how you should live as a person who wants to, wants to please the Lord. Je, uh, Galatians 5 and 1 Corinthians 13. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. You might want to look those up in, in Galatians chapter 5. They take a little thought, a lot of thought, because those are gifts that are supposed to be given to us by God's own spirit, and you and I should be using them. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, speaking God's message, speaking in tongues, ability to interpret tongues. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It'd be worth some time as well. There's more. The Apostle Paul worked at his original craft as he did his missionary work, remember? He wanted to pay his own way, so as he went to different cities, he would get with the tent makers, and he would work at making tents, because that was his, that was his craft. The point is this, people of the resurrection, people of the resurrection use their gifts, their resources, and their talents to tell and show others about their faith in God through Jesus Christ. You and I have gotten kind of sloppy about this, to tell the truth. It's easier for us not to use our gifts because we are people of the resurrection. It's easier for us to ask our church to represent us as people of the resurrection. But that's not the way churches work. Churches are to encourage us to help us utilize our gifts, our talents, our resources. Churches are to help individuals be the Christians they want to do, be. And I think this is important. You and I believe in Jesus. He said, take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep. 
if we are people of the resurrection, that is our call. Two times this week, I had more vegetables than are healthy for a person. You ever drank the, drink the V8 juice? Not the little cans, the big cans. And right on the can it says, this is equivalent to two servings of vegetables. That's a pretty good way to get your vegetables in, I think. You think it is, or do you think it'd be more healthy if I had some vegetables with every meal? Graydon's saying, yeah, I'd be more healthy if you had vegetables with every meal. Well, you and I like to make things as simple and easy as we can, and we've done the same thing with this table. Shame on us. We've decided that we would accept the love and the mercy of Jesus by partaking of the bread and the juice, and we would celebrate the, the breaking of Christ's body and the spilling of his blood to save us, and we would do it in this nice, tight little ceremony where we just have to walk up and take the bread and take the juice, and, and we're done, and then we can go back. We have, we have consolidated it like the V8 people have done with vegetables to try to make it as quick and palatable and easy as we possibly can. And that's a shame. This is so rich. And remembering what Jesus has done for us, it calls us to be so much more than we are. We need to remember and we need to accept his gift and we need to be the people he wants us to be. While they were eating, Jesus took a piece of bread gave a prayer of thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take it, he said, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks to God, and handed it to them, and they all drank from it. And Jesus said, this is my blood, which is poured out for many, my blood which seals God's covenant. Would you pray with me? Lord, at the table of remembrance, we recall the agony and the suffering you went through on the cross in our place. Your Father sent you for this purpose, to save us through your sacrifice. We drink the juice and eat the bread, representing the blood from your wounds and the suffering in your body. And we are so thankful that our Father loves us so much that he would give his own son over to death for our atonement. We are forgiven in our sin through our Lord Jesus. Our Father, we marvel at your power and majesty over sin and death and raising our Lord and setting him at your right hand. We look to heaven knowing the Father and Son are lording and loving us through your spirit. Give us strength and give us hope now and eternally in your richest love. Now would you pray with me the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
in our call to offer to um, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Um, Neglected to say that the offerty plates are in the back of the sanctuary. If you're worshiping online, um, you can click on our web, web page and go to the online giving tab um, and give to the church that way. Um, would you pray with me, please? Lord, we've received bountifully for that we are grateful. Now, the most in the most robust way, guide us in how we can give back what we've received through our treasure and through our challenge in your church. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thursday, Thursday I got a text. It said, uh, FT question mark. What did that mean? I got the same text on Friday. I'll give you a hint. It's from my brother David. Just F, T, question mark. He's wondering if I had time to FaceTime with him. <laughs> I didn't on Thursday because we were watching a soccer game. I didn't on Friday because me and two of my uh, uh, brothers-in-law were beating Mary Kay and two of her sisters at pitch. We beat them two games in a row. <clears throat> Just in case you wondered. But on Saturday, I sent him a text FT question mark asking if he had time to face FaceTime and he did our invitations come to us in different ways I mean we do this invitation every week so that if you have never given your life to Christ and the Spirit has helped you move to do it now we give you that opportunity to come up and accept him as Lord and Savior but his call comes to us his invitation comes to us in all sorts of different ways. We might hear it when we're home reading the Bible or when we're home praying or when we're taking a walk or mowing the lawn or we no telling when we might hear it, when a piece of Christian music moves us, when we see some kind gesture of one person to another and we'll hear the call of Jesus and if we've never accepted him, there may be a little blip in our heads and it says, it may be the time for you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Or if you've already done that, that little blip may be telling you, it's time to remember. It's time to focus. You are a child of God and a person of the resurrection. You need to make some changes. If this is the day that the Spirit has moved you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come forward and do so as we stand and sing this song together. We stand.
be seated, please. I don't know if uh, you have to hurry. I don't know if you all have had a chance to meet with uh, Jeff Schneiderman during his uh, weeks and months, and he's been with us for a long time, visiting with us, participating with us, getting to know us. And Jeff has decided today that uh, it's the moment when he would like to make his confession of faith. And as you know, our two requirements for membership are a public confession of faith and a baptism. Jeff has already been baptized into Christianity, so today we have a simple question for him, and you might remember the times when you answered it. Jeff Schneiderman, I have a question for you. Upon the touch of the Spirit, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I do. You do? Will you bow your heads with us? Lord, I present Jeff to you. I ask that you wash him with your Spirit. I ask that you give him whatever gifts and fruits that your kingdom in this place needs. I ask that you hear him, that you hear his confession, that you forgive his sins, that you walk with him into life fully, that you be with him every moment of every day. Be a blessing to him. And if it be your will, let him be a blessing to us and us a blessing to him. All this we ask in Christ's name and in celebration of Jeff's confession. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a seat. I hope you find a moment to say hi to Jeff after, after the congregational meeting. I hope you sit right where you are until the congregational meeting has passed. And this week, I hope that the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Just call me Grace. Thank you. Thank you for staying and welcome to our congregational meeting. Let's open with a quick word of prayer, if we could, please. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house and stay for a few minutes to do the business of your church. We are grateful for this opportunity that has come to us after years of waiting for the opportunity to vote on a new leadership of this church. Be in our presence, Lord. Bless us as we hear about this gentleman and as we take action on it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to do two or three things in a rather short period of time. Uh, Number one is I'd like to have Mike come forward and give a presentation, a brief, brief, brief (laughs) (laughs) presentation of uh, Pastor Doug Pfeiffer's uh, bio. And we have copies of it. Most of you have probably received them from the various meetings that we've had. But while Mike gets started, if you have not received a copy, please raise your hand and we'll bring them to you right away. Following, uh, following Mike's presentation, 
we'll have Jan Stribling come and present the financial package. So if you have not received the bio of Doug Pfeiffer, please raise your hand. I'd like to take uh, just a minute to let you, uh, you, those of you who haven't seen his bio, take a quick peek at it. It's a brief one-page bio, pretty abbreviated with uh, some of the things that Doug, Pastor Doug, wanted, to, wanted us to know about him. And I've got a presentation. I've given one to our personnel team that... Our search team gave a presentation to our personnel team that lasted over an hour and a half. Um, I was asked to refine that. In a board meeting, I think I took 45 minutes, and uh, I think that I was asked to refine that again, and so that uh, we don't keep you all too long today, I really cut it down to the key points about this uh, candidate that, uh, that we like so much. So um, with that, I think I will... Go ahead and get started, and if you have any questions on the bio or of me, go ahead and let me finish, and, uh, and then we'll take any questions you have about uh, Doug's background and uh, his leadership. Uh, Doug has served in ministry and in his vocation since 1994. He served as, se as a pastor, a senior minister, a church planter, and as a congregational assessor. He served in Altoona, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, Papillon, Nebraska, Indianapolis, Indiana, and as recently uh, in Adel, Iowa. Pastor Doug would offer worship leadership that's inclusive and participatory, including traditional elements, engaging different senses of the participants, and offering an experience of the holy. His administrative leadership would effectively use talents and gifts of church participants so that the church would establish and fulfill God's vision for us. His key areas of interest for ministry include community service, innovative worship offerings, lay leadership development, and spiritual and educational development of the church. Through his years of experience in church leadership and dynamics, he seeks to build trust and success in ministry through avoiding stumbling blocks and edges by abiding in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, which he summarizes by stating, when having differing opinions, honest and open communication, spoken love will keep and build strong, healthy relationships within the church. He is a very team-oriented leader, he would desire to build, train, and support teams to address focus needs in our community. Also, with that, he is very civic-minded and is excellent at building relationships and being involved in the community that he's ministering in. He's long been involved in the Disciples of Christ camp in Newton, providing both leadership and camp directorship. And he's also very active in our region, providing cluster leadership and regional committee leadership and, and much more. That, uh, that He's got quite a bio when you take a look at everything that he's been involved in over the years. Uh, Pastor Doug is an extremely active spiritual leader. He takes very good care of himself physically. Um, he's involved in biking, running, swimming, sometimes all on the same day, which is incredible to me. He cares for himself spiritually with regular times of prayer and meditative Bible study and many more disciplines, and he instructs and teaches us to do the same. Doug is married to his wife, Debbie, who is a self-employed mental health therapist. Together, they have one adult son who is married to his wife, and they have a three-year-old son who is the center of Doug and Debbie's life when he's with them. Uh, Pastor Doug is 62 years old. He carries with him a very mature but humble confidence in his leadership, and he enjoys leading youth as well as adults. Um, as in our current and past pastors, you can really sense the spirit of God in Doug. And uh, 
These are a few of the things that our search team believes that would make him a blessing as a senior pastor at Park Avenue Church. Can I answer any questions of, um, about Pastor Doug and his bio? I'll turn it over to uh, Jan or Gary. Thank you all. Um, as you can see in the sheet that was handed out, um, the search committee and the personnel and board um, passed that this be the proposed package. In the orange column, that's the proposed package of what we offer Pastor Doug if he is approved today. On the screen, um, you will see it broken down as the first column, the beige column is a seven month is the budget for seven months if he were to start June 1st and the light green column